Hello and welcome everybody to another edition of the Buy Round Interview Show. Now today I am joined by a guest I am really excited to sit and talk to, a man who has led an amazing life, coached all over the world in rugby union, um, and somebody that seems to have a lot of admiration for rugby league and its people, a man that's been in the headlines quite a bit recently, Eddie Jones. How are you, mate? I am doing fantastic. A little bit nervous about this, in in, <laughs> in, in all honesty, uh, but excited to uh, to get stuck into to some interesting topics, but never mind how I am. How are you? It's been uh, quite the couple of weeks. Yeah, no, it's been interesting, mate. Um, yeah, it was a... Difficult assignment coming back to Coach Australia three months before the World Cup. Um, and obviously, you know, I signed for five years, uh, wanted to change the game, but uh, at the end of the day, like apart from the World Cup, you know, there were conditions that needed to be fulfilled for me to be able to do the job properly to change Australian rugby and they weren't able to be done. So we've moved on, you know, uh, a bit disappointing, mate. Yeah, uh, I'm very disappointed actually, but you move on. Yeah, ju just um, quickly on on the World Cup, um, because we are going to talk a lot about yeah. the, the differences and similarities and what we can learn from each other as codes of rugby. Um, the occasion over in France, it looked like such an amazing tournament. The atmosphere, the the the, the press, the fans. Um, it captured the headlines. It must have been quite the tournament, despite results not going your way, to be a part of. Yeah, well, it was probably the best World Cup in terms of atmosphere at the games. Like every game was sold out, and they were like more like soccer fans rather than rugby, because rugby fans are usually, you know, it's a bit of a uh, leather patch on the elbows. They sit there pretty, you know, um, placidly, but they were, they, the crowds were into it. You know, they were really quite vocal. It's good weather, uh, you know, mostly soccer grounds, so the, the, the crowd's close and the atmosphere was fantastic. Yeah, it, it certainly appeared that way, and I know speaking to a lot of people back home, it, it was – you knew the rugby union cup world cup the rugby union world cup was 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 happening it was on that's probably something i think league rugby league needs to 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 take a a leaf out of um like you say it it didn't go so well for for australia just looking back so i've i've, I've looked at this yeah. it started with your um, your your press conference before you left. Now, I've worked with a lot of great coaches yeah. and sometimes an event or a co press conference like that, there's more than meets the eye or meets the ear. Was there something else, was there a distraction you were trying to, or a false flag? Was there, was there something else behind it other than you guys don't believe in us? Uh there was, a, there was a couple of things. Like, firstly, I, th I thought, like, Australia's had a, a a barren period for 20 years. You know, we haven't won the Bledisloe Cup, which is like, you know, you talk about St Helens at Wigan. If St Helens went 20 years without beating Wigan, you know, there'd be a, there'd be a national <laughs> inquiry in St Helens, you know. And, and so Australia's had 20 years, so I wanted to change things. And I, I got there, got to Australia, you know, you, like like Cage comes in, you work out who's in the room, you work out, right, can I work with this group of players or do I need to change it to go where we need to go, which is to win a World Cup in 2027. And I thought we need... 2027? Yeah. So 2000, 2023 was always going to be difficult, mate. You know, we had, you know, I had three days of training before our first, first game in the rugby championship, so... To change the team that had been eighth or ninth to win that World Cup was always going to be problematical. So it was about, all right, what can I do here to get the best result? You know? And that's not to say we couldn't win the World Cup, but 
the reality was we needed to build something that could win the World Cup when Australia hosts in 2027. So I had a look at the room, felt we're not going to do it with these guys. Uh, we're not going to do well enough at this World Cup and a lot of those guys weren't going to be ready for the World Cup. So, so I thought we've got to do a total rebuild here mm. and, and made the decision to rebuild rebuild the team. And, and there's obviously risk with that because with young guys, you know, you know, they can meld in the, on the occasion. Um, so I knew that risk was coming, but I'd rather set Australia up to be successful for 2027. And that involves some very difficult d decisions to be made, right? With the, you know, the, the axing of those, in particular, those three, three really experienced players that, that, that missed out. Um, was that a decision that you'd, you'd maybe look back and change or you, you were happy with that decision? No, nah, not at all, mate, not at all. I always, always think you're better off making that decision earlier. Yeah, and sometimes for a coach that means a bit of bit of pain at the start of your tenure that you're going to get the results further down the track. And I just felt at that time those players weren't right for the team. You know, there's there's always it's a judgment, isn't it? Selection. Yeah, and you're making your judgment right. James Graham at 32 is he good for the Bulldogs now? Right. I've still James, got it. Yeah. <laughs> James Graham at 33 is he good for the Bulldogs? And you're making that decision, and it's it's a combination of factors. It's it's how you play, how you handle yourself off the field, what's your relationship like with the younger players? You know, are you the are you the role model to develop that talent? You know, and you're looking for the older players, you're looking for role models to develop the talent coming through, apart from obviously playing well. I just made that decision, nah, this wasn't right. And we needed to just cut the ties and, and go forward. And that was purely on uh, uh, more of a focus on the World Cup in 27 mm. as opposed to the one in 23. Well, I thought, you know, with the team we had, we could stagger, at best stagger into the quarterfinals. And that's not good enough. Mm. Like, so I decided I'd go with young guys and see, you know, if, we, if everything went really well and we kept all our best players on the field, then we could make a bit of a... A statement, you know, maybe make the semi-finals. You make the semi-finals, your chance of winning the comp. Mm. But there's a big jump between the quarterfinals and the semi. Mm. You know, from top eight to top four. Mm. So I thought with with the young guys we could make the quarterfinals and then possibly make the semis. With the older players, I didn't think we could we could do more than a quarterfinal. So you make that judgment, and so I don't have any regrets yeah. at all. Just back to that to that press conference where you sort of. You know, you, you you could say you you attacked the, the Australian media, call, calling them negative. Now I know what it's like being part of that group. You need a bit of a narrative, a bit of us against them mentality. Is that something that you were you were trying to to deliver to your message, the, the, deliver almost to the players that hey boys, it's us against the world here. Even our own country don't want us to win this. They they don't believe, but we need to. Yeah, a little bit, and and also for a young group. When you got a young group, you want to, they want to see that the coach is sticking up for them, you know, mm. because they're criticising the selection. So I thought, you know, I've got to support this young group as much as I can, and and that ma meant taking a bit of flack myself for getting out there. But you know, you're going with a little bit of a plan, and then someone asks you a stupid question, and sort of that plan becomes either larger. And maybe a bit more vocal and a bit more in your face, which which probably happened. Yeah, that that's the sort of untrained eye, untrained ear, not seeing what you were trying to do. Yeah, there, and I think a, a lot of coaches do that. They they become the target rather than the players become the target. So all of a sudden, going into the World Cup, you were the you were the target, and the the play that that maybe. That was your plan to distract the media onto you. Well, I don't, I don't think the players need any more pressure. You know, for, mm. I think for one of the things that's really changed, and, and you'd understand it better than anyone, for young players now, the pressure that they get through social media is huge. That, mm. you know, 20 years ago, no one had to handle that. So I wanted to try to cocoon them as much as we could, just allow them to concentrate on their rugby. Because, again, for some of these players, you know, Super Rugby now, you play at the football stadium, a big crowd's 10,000. You go down the Rebels, there's 3,000 and a dog. And sometimes a dog doesn't come. 
You know, so they're playing in front of 45,000 people at, at St. Eddie and with them yelling and screaming. This is a different – so they don't need yeah. more pressure off the field. Mm. You know, they need to be able to cope with that pressure. So that's how we ran, mate. Yeah. Um, just, again, on, on the World Cup, there has been uh, reports that you were talking with other teams about, about future jobs. Is that completely false? Oh, it's a red herring, mate. Absolute red herring. Yeah, you know, conversations go on all the time. Mm. You know, people, agents ring you up. They, they, you know what it's like. Mm. We all know what it's like. I didn't have any. Why would I have signed for five years and taken a young squad? Like, if I was going to go to somewhere else, why would I take a young squad and put myself out there? Mm. You know, I could have just taken the the, the solid players. Yeah, you know, and and fans love senior players, don't they? Yeah. Yeah, it's like they love pop music, you know, your producer there is just from, from Triple M and, and what they always try to do is make people comfortable and people are comfortable with senior players. So if I was intending to go somewhere else, why would I take a young squad Yeah, unless I'm a lunatic, which I'm probably close to but not a fully blown <laughs> lunatic. So, so then w w what exactly changed you, you, you in your first year in a five-year plan with, with the focus on... On, on 27, what changed? Well, we need to change the whole system, yeah. mate. It's like, you know, what's happening at the Bulldogs now. You know, Gus has gone in there because the system's not good enough. Mm. It's not producing the players of quality. It's not producing the number of quality. So you've got to change the system. In Australian rugby, we've had 20 years of not not being successful and we need to change the system. So it means how do we, how do we get the super rugby sides to... To interact with the Australian with the Australian team, the Wallabies, and that needed to change. And 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 that before I came in the job, I said this needs to happen, guys. Otherwise, we're not going to get the results we need to get. So, we, were you made promises there that then weren't capped? It was a contractual situation where they had to provide a, certain resources to change this, and they weren't able to do it. Right, because I've heard you speak about other great coaches. One of those, Arsene Wenger, and I heard you say that Wenger said he'd never take the national teams because he couldn't control the talent yeah. coming through. But you then do take over the national team and you don't – is that something that you were trying to do is to control that talent coming yeah. through? And I guess this leads to, to my next question of you, you speak about the, the state of play at Rugby Australia. What's going to fix it? What area – of focus do they need to concentrate on? Is it the pathway system? Is it going getting a, a superstar? Is it more of a, 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 a um, you know, a, a focus on f fans to the game? Is it a focus off, you know, the um, elitism that's associated with rugby and the private school boys? Where should that area of focus be? Well, if we go back a step, you look at a country like Ireland, s six million people. They've been ranked number one in the world in rugby. With six million people, mm. you got New Zealand. Four million people have been consistently winning at eighty percent, right? So you look at our five Super Rugby teams. So just remember those stats. We've got four teams that average under twenty percent win record against New Zealand sides. Under twenty percent. Like that basically means you're not turning up. Yeah, you know, and. And so our system needs to change. So Ireland, go back to Ireland again, six million people. Uh, what they've done is they've got all the four provinces there mm -hmm. working together to produce the national team. And with that, they've got a province, Leinster, who's the best team in Europe, and Ulster, who's in, probably in the top eight teams in Europe. So it doesn't stop the provinces being strong, but it, because they're all engaged, they collaborate, they're cohesive, they produce a great... Island team. That, and even doing that, they weren't good enough to get out of the quarterfinals. Even doing that. So Australia, we've got, we've got five teams that all operate independently, that all operate to the, to the, to the beat of their own drum, um, and we're not winning. And so we need to get those five states to work together. We need to make sure the pathway is, is capturing the talent that's there, you know. Kids now, you know, if you look at that to his new can, if he's if he's fast and he's strong and he's got ball skills, NRLs all over him. Mm. 
there's 20, or oh, how many clubs there are, yeah. 18 clubs all wanting. So we've got to make sure those kids stay in rugby. How do you do that? Well, you've got to make it exciting for them, mate. Because the big thing, you know, you've just spoken about the World Cup. If you, if you, if you can paint that picture in a player's head, of course they'll get more money playing in NRL initially, but that whole thing of playing in the World Cup, like young Jorgensen, Max Jorgensen, so he did the whole pre-season with the Roosters. Right, was probably going to play in their first team. But Australian rugby last year took him on an Australia A tour to Japan and he fell in love with rugby. He thought, how good is this? Mm. And, and then he comes to the World Cup as an 18-year-old. Unfortunately, gets injured at training, doesn't play. But he's, you know, he's invested in rugby now because he can see what it can bring him. So, you know, and, and therefore, if, you, if you're aggressive and you're consistent and you work hard with those young kids... Because we, we're missing out on too many of them at this stage. We've yeah. got to get more of them. Yeah, it, it, it's clear that the, the young, prominent Australian athlete uh, around about that, you know, those impressionable teenage years when they're you know, making a, a decision on sport d d do seem to be, be choosing um, rugby league, NRL, o over the, the potential for that long-term you know, goal of playing in a World Cup or playing in a home uh, series a, a, against the Lions. Is is that the, the, the only issue? Well, it's a, you got to fix up the bottom and you got to fix up the top, how the super rugby sides work. And they've all got to be, work, be working together. You've got to have plans for the top 40 players, make sure they're training at a high quality, make sure they're practising their skills at a high quality so they become better players. And at the moment that's not the case. Should Rugby Union go after more of the current NRL stars? Obviously, we've seen um, Joseph Suali, he recently signed um, for Rugby Australia. Should they go after more? I reckon that bobblehead over there would do pretty good, mate. <laughs> <laughs> There's two of them there, Cleary yeah. and uh, Josh Adekar. Uh, you think they... Do you th uh, well, I think that's that's a bit of icing on the cake, you know, and, and it, it's good for the stature of rugby to, to get one or two of those top players. Um, and it captures headlines, mate. You yeah. know, so I think they're always useful, but they're they're just a little bit of the icing on the cake. Yeah, it, it's interesting. I'll I'll, I'll get into um, a little bit more about the, the the message that that maybe says because yeah. I think you it's clear you have a uh, a big admiration for um, for Ru for for Ruby Lee and its and its people. I guess the the question I'm I'm thinking of asking or I'm going to ask is. As a head coach, is it your job to worry about that or is it your job to coach the team? Uh, well, ideally not. Mm. But if you're, not, if, if you're taking over a team that's been unsuccessful, then you've got to, you've got to work out why it's been unsuccessful. Like that's, that's your job, you know. What a coach is, they're problem solvers. And if you've got a, if you've got a, a, a consistent problem in a club, then you've got to work out ways to fix it. And you've got a consistent problem in the country, you've got to work out ways to think it. And, and that initially starts with a national coach, but then you want a, a performance director or, or someone like that, a general manager, to be driving all those, all those systems, just like you know, Gus does at Canterbury. Yeah. So let's go back. 2022, you come over here and you, you win a series with England. Um, like... Why? Why then come back here? Why come back and coach Australia? Because I'm an Aussie, mate, and you know it, it. It made me sad how bad Australian rugby was doing. And so I wanted, was it an emotional decision? Do yeah, you think to to hundred percent. There wasn't any, wasn't any sense in doing it uh, because they'd been unsuccessful. They hadn't. They hadn't. There hadn't been any change in the system. But I thought I'll give it a go. Mm. Yeah, you know, and I'd rather, I'd rather sit back. And sit as I'm sitting here, yeah. And everyone says, "Well, he, this bloke can't coach. He's a failure. You know, he's an idiot." I'd rather have done have a go at doing that and mm. and cope with the criticism and than sitting back and saying, "No, no, no. It's safer not to do that." Mm. Or I I should have took that job. Yeah, yeah. Um, did that affect you when the the fan called you a traitor? Ah, uh, not really, mate. I just made a bit of a thing because again. Yeah, you know, for the English boys, they want to know I'm, I was 100% in with them, which I was. 
Yeah, you know, so again, that just makes a bit of a. St- you've always got to be trying to making statements for your players, mm. you know, because they want to be they want to be working together. They want to feel the coach has always got mm. their back. I, 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 I personally yeah. loved it. Yeah, so I, yeah. I thought you you fire them back like people can have their say, yeah. but you got to be careful what you're saying. Yeah. Don't be so surprised just because there's a, a little wall there when someone fires back and says, "Let's have a go." There's a backstory to it. Is that so, so the bloke? You know, he was obviously he drank a few of those too. He's new, <laughs> uh, and he was a friend. He was the son of a friend of a, a really good mate of mine, but one of my best mates, right? Oh, so you did you? I you, didn't know him. I oh. didn't know him. But then, so the next day, you know, it's all it's all gone off, and I get this email, this contrite email from this young fellow who was who was drunk. And then I get phone calls from my mate saying, oh, shit, he's so embarrassed. And he ended up getting in trouble with the trust, I think. Oh. Yeah. So I felt a bit sorry for him mm. in the end. Mm. Yeah, well, because even, you know, with the with what happened at the at the Ashes and the Australian cricketers getting, you know, a- abused by the, fa- the the ones that had a crack back. Like, I'm English, but I'm like, good, good on yeah. them. Uh, good on, good on you uh, for like, but you just cop abuse. You don't say anything back, and uh, then everyone all of a sudden is surprised that yeah. you had the, you know, the courage to say, I'm, "You can just let's go." Like, put your money where your mouth is. Maybe uh, that's just my characteristics. And I no, no, I think uh, yeah, we were pro- probably brought up the same way, mate. Yeah, like someone's gonna if, well chat shit get hit yeah. right yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah maybe I'm, you can do that i can't do that. I've got the size just to do swinging it, in yeah, yeah hold me back hold me back oh yeah um so on to on to the i guess that this, this battle that rugby australia faces with nrl it's actually it looks like it's going the other way now with um the rugby league um or the NRL rather, uh, announcing that they'll look to give players, uh, sorry, clubs, salary cap exemptions to go off the special talent. So uh, the young winger, Marky Mark, I'm not even going to pretend to be able to pronounce his <laughs> surname. I, uh, I was watching clips of his last night. What a player. Yeah, yeah, what no, a no. difficult surname to pronounce. So um, he's one that's in the in the target. Is this a, is, do you think this is a, a realistic threat? And then... Is that then a threat to the Lions tour coming up, the the World Cup in 27? And I think you've said Australia are 20 years away. Yeah. Well, I think, yeah, you know, NRL's got the horse guy, mate. He's not bad, eh? He's good. He's good he's operator. Good. Gets things yeah. done. And he, and he gets things done. His timing of, of getting on the job, like he doesn't wait around. He obviously doesn't have much of a committee. He just makes <laughs> a decision, which is, you know, why, why it's been – why he's been successful and to do that just makes a statement because at the end of the day there might be only one or two players they sign but it's already made a statement it's already got people thinking mm. um so i think that's that's brilliant but i don't think there's going to be a a huge hunk of rugby players go across the league because you know it's all being done as we spoke about before in the schools that's where the damage is being done so this is just a great PR thing by Volandis. You just you just think it's a, a PR. So you yeah. don't think that that player in particular will uh, make his way. Well, I'm gonna have not, a go. He might, mate. But no one to Wazy. Yeah, that's not bad. <laughs> no, no one to Wazy. There's a Q or a P in there. As he's well. half half Italian, half Fiji. Yeah. He's a great player. He, I know. Yeah, I, no, look, he's, he's, he's he's a brilliant. Mm. He's just learning. He's just learning his game now, and that's what I'm saying. Like in four years' time, he's had this experience at the World Cup. You know, he's he's when you have a World Cup like that, you remember it the rest of your life. Mm. Yeah, you know? and and you'll remember when you lost a big final. You never forget that. And sometimes these experiences form the core of of good teams going forward. So, you know, there's been all this doom and gloom about the team at the moment, but I think this experience is going to be a, a massively uh, solid uh, uh, experience that drives the players closer together, drives the players to work harder and out of it. And Mark Mark was one of those young kids, mate. He, like he's played 15 Super Rugby sides. He's 
games. He's played 10 tests now. He's played in the heat. His experience failure, you know, he's going to come through and be a great player. It's amazing what you can achieve when you go through adversity. Yeah. And you're in that group of players and, you know, it might just take a couple of those those younger lads that are emerging leaders to go, are we going to put up with this anymore? Like, could, could that be something that you would, if you were still coach, be looking at to to try and instigate? Uh, well, I think that'll happen, mate. And I like it's, I could see the look in your eyes there. It changed when you said that. Mm. And, you, you know, you only need three or four of those blokes to do that and the whole team changes then. Yeah. You know, and then you see at the end of training the senior blokes taking the younger guys for extra skill work and the team starts to change. Mm. You know, they do extra fitness work without the coach telling them. Mm. You know, and then the team starts to change and you get you get little bits and pieces of, of – advancement in in how the team operates under pressure you stick tighter together you know there's that 60 minute mark where the pressure comes on and when you're a tight team you just you just you welcome that pressure you want that pressure right boys here we go this is when it's on whereas when you're a young team you say shit this is happening again yeah you know and what are we going to do everyone's looking at each other mm. and that's what that's what where the team is at the moment but where they can grow is exactly what you're talking about. Yeah. I, I guess it, go back into that, how to fix it, th this problem, maybe part of the solution is to bring um, stars of the NRL uh, over, over to, to Rugby Australia. But that just subconsciously that send the, the, ro the wrong message to those players. I know when I was at... Um, uh, coming through the ranks at St. Helens, um, the NRL was always on a pedestal. Yeah. And whenever we signed Australian or New Zealand or Tongan Samoan players from this competition and brought them over to, to play in the Super League, there was a little bit of a sense of like, well, hang on, are we not good enough? And very important how those players integrated and their attitude of coming over to that competition. Is that a, is that a worry uh, or a concern for the people within Rugby Australia that they won't quite be as accepted as what perhaps they should be? And if you've got that core group of young leaders that are saying, no, it's just against them, do we need this person coming in on, you know, a sat, like he'd be the highest paid athlete in Rugby Australia's history. So is that the wrong message to send? Well, I'll tell a couple of stories to maybe make the point. Uh, so one of the first coaching or well, the first senior coaching job I had was the Brumbies. So 98 we came 10th, 99 we came 5th and we're just missing something. And I thought I just need one hard, one hard rugby league forward just to, Toughen us up. Why a bit. rugby league forward? Though? Because because like the difference, rugby is quite a technical game, right? And and we have eighty minutes. There's thirty two minutes ball in play, right? Rugby league fifty minutes ball in play. So the the fitness level and the and the ability to keep going, it, it's a different role model. So we signed Peter Ryan from the Broncos, like who was the hardest hitter in league. Then you know they used to have the big league yeah. and he'd always win that hardest hitter. And he was mad as a cut snake. <laughs> um, you know, if there was a fight on in the bar or on the field, he was in it. He was in everything. And he was just that 100% in bloke. And he just helped change the team. And then we signed Andrew Walker, who I played with at Randwick. And, and you know, he was scoring tries like, like – they were going out of business at the Roosters and we signed him and he became this try-scoring machine for us. Like absolutely try scoring machine. So Peter Ryan only played one game, semi final in two thousand one. For two years, he trained with the team, played one game. Really, one game. He might have played little bits and pieces, but hardly played. But he made such a difference to the team, mate. And Andrew Walker was the same. Um, and then two of the coaches we had. Remember Hodge, Brett Hodgson, mm. right? He went to the. Uh, Jay, John Clark, who you probably yeah, yeah. remember, you know, he was a strength and conditioning coach at the Wallabies, played for for Warrington. Mm. And Hodjo came over and he said they were doing weights, right? And Hodjo wasn't, you know, Hodjo's 80 kgs yeah, yeah. wet, you know. 
And Old Joe's sitting there eating a packet of chips and having a cake, right? And then, and then they're on the field, right? And JC goes to the blind side once and Old Joe's got stuck into him, you know, saying, what are you doing? And then, and then JC fired back at him, you know, saying, da, 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 you know. And so they, they established a good relationship going forward. But mm. the, the key is when you bring players in, they've got to have, they've got to have the right attitude. Because otherwise, like you have situations where it causes uh, uh, a bit of a, a problem in the team. And from what I know, with like Sawali, like every everyone who speaks about him, from school to obviously Trent Robinson, like he's a serious, you know, serious professional, works hard, and he'll be great, mate. I, I've had so many positive yeah. things about him. Uh, clean living, you know like so dedicated to his craft but i guess that let's let's be honest australian rugby is is lacking stars yeah, yeah. and he is going to be the poster boy the pinup boy the billboard boy he's going to be ev- he's going to be driving every commercial yeah firstly there's there's a lot of expectations with come that because I believe he's only 21 at yeah, this time. And, yeah. um, that might even be incorrect. He might be younger. He might still be in his 20s. Um, but that's a, that's a new expectation. To carry the hopes of a nation it is you know, be, beyond huge at such a young age. But then, you know, there can be a little bit of, well, I want I want what, what he's got. Is not only the attitude of Joseph important, but also the attitude of the players that are currently there that have to maybe, you know, accept, yes, we're going to do something about this. We're drawing that line, but we've not been good enough and we need a superstar. Yeah, I, I think, you know, initially most players will think like you're thinking. Like that's just that's just normal human condition, you know, yeah. want what other people want. But as yeah. soon as he starts playing, he starts playing hard and he starts winning games, like people forget about that, you know, and, and so you just got to perform. Thing is to get the right support around him, you know. Because sometimes you bring rugby league players over and you can overcoach them. Like it's going to be the level of coaching that he gets the right level of coaching. Don't take away the things he's good at. Let him do those, and just get him to understand the game a bit. And and uh, I think he'll he'll end up being a great role model. Yeah, I, I like I say, I've heard nothing but good things about him, and but he's got a lot of weight on on young shoulders yeah, yeah. again i'll probably ask you is there is there a couple more that as this war goes on that apart from the the, the two on the on the side there up and specifically nathan cleary that rugby australia could go after and should go after and what what would be the cap on that like how much is is too much how desperate do they need to be because it's going to be the law of Yes, you're going to play in a World Cup or potentially you're going to play in a World Cup or a home tournament here against the Lions. It's all fantastic, but a lot of it is going to come down to dollars and cents. Yeah. Well, I reckon if you had a had a wish list, like you'd get one in, say you got type five, middle five, outside five, so you got Sue Ali outside five, then you go for Cleary, middle five, run the team, and then I'd go for someone like... One of my best mates is a mad rooster supporter. He watches every game, you know. He knows the side inside out. And he and he looks at league players for me and he reckons that Gilbert up at the Dolphins. Like he's a bit like Peter Ryan. Oh, yeah. Hard, yeah. tough, like. And you just need another one of those because they just change the way you train. Hmm. He was um, – yeah, it surprised me to say that, but uh, you're right, he, he – lo- he, He's a goer. He's a good young player, mm. uh, and he's young and he's aggressive, and mm. he'd be bloody good. Yeah. Hey, you, you, you spoke there about some of the the league coaches that that, that you've brought in. Um, are they accepted by the group? Yeah. Yeah. Again, players just want to be coached well. Well, as long as they're coached they don't well, particularly no, care. They don't care whether they're, they're rugby league, rugby union. Like we had Siebes. At England, he did a great job defensively. Mm. Yeah, you know, and didn't know the game, but learned the game quickly. And the good coaches learn the game quickly. Mm. You know, 
And if they Ma- meet, Martin Gleeson as yeah, well. Yeah, Martin yeah. Gleeson. He's, he's a bit different. He's good value. <laughs> <laughs> I know the old Gleeson. So, yeah. no, he's changed a bit now. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And he's, he's doing well with Warrington. Oh, he was doing well with Warrington. Yeah, I think, I think, I think he's still there with yeah, Sam. I think, he's, yeah. I think he's going to continue, yeah, continue no. on. Did, did it help um, when you were with England having those players that have a little bit of rugby league background like Owen Farrell, who's obviously his father – was a, he did play rugby union towards the back end, but an absolute god in rugby league. And Owen would naturally have a, you know, you know, a, a sense of understanding of, of rugby league. And does that help having that senior figurehead in the group to say, now these these boys are actually all right. They know what they're doing. Ah, uh, that helps. And Owen again, like yeah, you know, because of his background with his father, just had that rugby league approach to his training. Like, yeah. You know, one of the things we're always trying to break in rugby is the way we train because it's always been quite a a sedate game. Like it's you know it's a relatively sedate game rugby compared to rugby league. And when we train at the level of rugby league for rugby union, the results are are evident. Like you you look at is Sean, that like a level of intensity? A level of intensity at training, like fast yeah. repetition. Yeah. And just being on it, mm. like being really on it. And again, Sean Edwards, you know, from Wigan, the effect that he's had on, on the French defence. And it's just intensity. The thing they've improved the most is their intensity and their ability to keep doing it. And that's where rugby league coaches are good, mate. We're going to take a quick break from this podcast to talk to you about AG1. Now, this is a product I've been taking for over a year now, and I absolutely love it. It gives me all of my daily nutritional needs in one easy drink. All you have to do is put in one scoop of AG1 into a nice cold glass of water and you are set for the rest of the day. The cupboard has been cleaned out of tablets and powders because all my needs are met by AG1. The power of routine cannot be underestimated and we all know how small habits lead to big wins. Some of those big wins for me have included better gut health. My clarity, especially in the afternoon, has improved so much gone as the mid-afternoon slump. AG1 is a foundational nutritional supplement. Now, as humans, we all share that same basic foundational needs. That's where AG1 take care of everything. This supports your body's needs like nutrient replenishment, gut optimization, stress management, and immune support. AG1 is the supplement I trust to provide the support my body needs daily. And that's why they've been a partner and I've been a user for so long. If you want to take ownership of your health, it starts with AG1, a buy round exclusive. If you try AG1, you get a free one year supply of vitamin D3, K2, and five free AG1 travel packs with your first purchase. Go to drinkag1.com forward slash buy round. That's drinkag1.com forward slash buy round for our exclusive Australia wide offer. Check it out. One of those league players that uh, you had a big admiration for but didn't get was Joey Johns. Um, how close were you to, to landing him and what were those conversations like with, with Joey? Uh, we used to have this uh, – John Fordham, who unfortunately passed away, was a, uh, a prominent league agent. Um, and we used to have this code. I think Joey was X and uh, – and cross Ryan Cross was Y, and we were having dinner with X and Y tonight at my place. Be there, and we <laughs> we would have had maybe three or four what, dinners y there, code? Uh, or just so that no one had picked ah. it up. And we had it all under wraps, mate. Like, and we had had agreed to the contract, signed, signed, still delivered, Wait, signed yeah. the deal, signed, done, and all we needed was the uh, Rugby Australia board approval. And they knocked it back. Why? Uh, well, I think because, yeah, he'd been a bit loose off the field, Joey. Uh, <laughs> and and he had a neck problem and they were a bit worried about paying a lot of money for him. But, yeah, it's probably one of the, the worst decisions ever made because he would have he changed the game. He would have changed. Yeah, you just got to watch him play league. Yeah, it's like Cleary. Those guys who, who can run a game like, like he, Joey and Cleary can, they change the game. Well, Joey could have bought not just fans with him, people, players, 
youngsters. Yeah, and you know, we I still catch up to him every now and then, and he's he's you know he watches the odd game. And back then he'd be saying, "Oh, can we do this? Can we do this?" You know, he's he was a student of the game. Yeah. So when you had those conversations with him, was he pretty open to to coming in and see? Because I've heard him speak, and he can pick apart a game like magnificently. He sees things that, you know, less than 0.001% of the population can see. Was he having those conversations? Yeah. Were you genuinely like excited about him coming on? This isn't just league's biggest name. This is someone that's coming with an yeah. attitude and intent, yeah. starting to look, yeah. starting to observe. Yeah. He can go be beyond me even as a coach. Yeah, no, absolutely 100%. It was yeah. the biggest disappointment, mate. Did, did you butt heads with the decision makers? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Mm. Probably not in a good way, mate. No, I can only, <laughs> um, I can only ima imagine. Um, but those, those, sort of, those sort of blokes, are, they, 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 they're game changers. You know, they can change a team, change the way the sport's played. Like, you know, back in the old, this goes back early 2000s, I used to meet, meet with Gus and he'd, he'd look at our games, you know, and just have a different view. So I've always had a rugby league guy historically look at how we play and, and is there anything different? Because just having a different eye, just like, you know, I look at Lee and I know bugger all, but there's always something I think, you know, could you do this in the game? Mm. Um, and it just re it's really helped me in my in my coaching career having league guys either on staff or in the background, you know, having a look at that and having imagine having Joey there who, you know, as you said, can can see a, a defence pattern quickly, can break open the defence pattern. Imagine that in rugby. Yeah, and what what he what he teach the yeah. the people around yeah. him because I I do notice that there are some shapes that begin in league and quickly start to manifest it in union even the you know the crossfield bomb yeah has become yeah, a real yeah a yeah. real weapon are, are you are you and your staff constantly looking for that and are you is that why you lean on the league people to bring in those ideas well i think i think you know the intensity of the nrl brings new ideas forward um, you know, the intensity of a comp is how new ideas come because you've got, you know, say they're the top eight teams, what's going to separate them? Yeah. There's Not much. The person, there's always personnel, there's always mm. the halfback personnel, but it's then finding a point of difference that you can be ahead of the pack. And just watching Penrith play, you know, the way they attack, and again, I don't know a lot, but the way they attack the inside of the ruck, Mm. and then tighten up the ruck and then shift the ball. You know, so they've set a way of doing that, a very specific way of doing it, and you can see other teams trying to copy that now, but it's too late. So in, in rugby, you know, we, we try to pick out the best ideas from league and then see if it works in our game. Yeah. Are, are there any other sports that you look to? And, and I've heard a number of times you, you speak about you, you have an admiration of, of soccer and the... Yes, a bit of a student, read a lot of books and, and listen to a lot of the great coaches in, in other sports. Is there any in particular that stand out or is there any other things from other sports that you've taken and, and would look to implement into your program? Uh, particularly soccer, mate. We uh, back, back when I took over Japan in 2015 because we needed to do something different to get them to win. So I, I uh, looked in the tact tactical periodization, spent a fair bit of time studying that. Went and saw Pep at Bayern Munich, uh, watched them. Went tactical period, sorry, tactical periodization. Can you expand on that? Well, it's, bas it's basically, yeah, everyone talks about a game model now. You know, you talk 10 years ago, no one spoke about a game model. Everyone's got a game model now. And then basically you're using your every minute in, the ga in your week to, to, to rehearse your game model. And so all your physical training is done through you through your game model. So you create games to do your physical training to get fit through the game model. Mm. And football, were, soccer was miles ahead of everyone. So I went there, went to Qatar, caught up with the – because it originated from Portugal. 
um, and and Jose Mourinho, yeah, it was mm. stole stole the march on everyone, yeah, because his team's trained better, yeah, and that's yeah. why he had that unbelievable successful period. And now everyone's doing it in their own way, and we took that to rugby, and then and certainly with Japan, it gave us a point of difference. What year was it where you were? Um Japan coach because I'm, I'm interested to, to find out about how you got them from um, minnows to you know beating South yeah, Africa 2012 to 2015 yeah and so we trained we trained through that tactical periodization model and and they were the most cohesive team I've ever trained yeah was that an openness to learn as well uh, a need to learn a need like, to learn yeah I think everyone's open to learning when they need to learn um yeah, I've been just this morning, so I'm about to break into. I don't know what I'm going to be doing next, but I want to. I've got to find something new that's going to take whatever team I take to a different level. And I've just been reading a rereading a book called Sprawl Ball, which is about the, the the evolution of the three points in NBA. I'm thinking, what's what's the next three point in rugby? You know, what's going to change rugby? Because if you don't have as good personnel as, say, New Zealand or, or, or South Africa, then what's your point of difference yeah. going to be? Yeah, where are you, what are you looking to exploit? Well, I think, I think yeah, it, the game's become, rugby's come, if you use the analogy of basketball, rugby's come a big ball, yeah, big men. It's about, about you know, physically dominating, winning the air and then playing off the scraps. Yeah, mm. can you can you play a small ball? Can you play quicker? Can you play faster? Can you develop players that defensively are more agile, faster? Uh, that gives you a point of difference. Well, do you think rugby would be more open to um, perhaps a more expansive style? Well, that's and, the, and I know I've heard you speak about when you were England coach and that they wanted to play very technical and. Win the scrum and when and that's it gets you results yeah. right. But then you say about you know you want to win and you win well. Is there is there a scope for a team that maybe isn't the 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 all back but backs or, or the spring box? Maybe even for a team like Australia that behind to just go with an attitude of we're just gonna almost buzz ball like and we'll yeah. die on that shield. Yeah. We'll, 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 we're gonna put this down. This yeah. is gonna be our style. And we're going to die on this hill. Oh, I, I think there's definitely an opportunity to do that, mate. But again, you need time with the players, and you need the players to be fitter. You need them to be more skilled to play that sort of game where, you, where, where you're going for high it. risk. Yeah, just like you know, you were talking about. We were talking before the show about your ability to pass at the line. Like, imagine if you had rugby forwards, one or two rugby forwards that could do that. I imagine, imagine how the game would change, mate. I've Seeing, I, I, I'm not an, like a an avid follower of rugby union, but I've been to enough games and watching it, watch enough of it, and I'd sometimes look at it and go, you know what? If he had someone pushing with him, yeah, it's on. That's what I mean. So, yeah, and particularly now in rugby, you know, where we don't have ten meters back, mm. yeah, you know, they're three meters and coming off the line, it actually creates that opportunity because well, but, well also you you see that the, the shoulders of the forwards. It's naturally turned in towards the rook, and there's reason yeah. behind that. But if you were a forward taking a carry and perhaps weren't looking for the for because they're not, it's a different psyche, and, and you perhaps weren't looking for the ground, but you were looking up, and you had support players pushing into holes, pushing into space. I, I think there's a, a huge opportunity, massively, massively, mate. But to do that, then again, you've got to get kids to do it from an early age. And this is what I'm talking about. That's where Australian rugby needs to change. You've got to develop a point of difference and you've got to do that from kids. You've got to get your super rugby sides to be practising that. And then you, can, then you can create a different game because I think in rugby at the moment there is an opportunity to play a much more passing game, but it's mm. got to be short passes. And again, to, to have a short passing game, you need to be highly skilled. Yeah, you've just got to work. Well, yeah. You gotta practice, practice, and practice, and, and practice. practice, and practice, and be willing to make mistakes and almost be embarrassed. Yeah, because the live play and 
you know, you do all that practice for four a game, yeah. five a game, yeah. you got to see the value in it. Yeah. But yeah. but I've, I've observed some games with Rabun and just think, yeah. oh, oh, just take a mate with you and just pop them up <laughs> and, and you're through. Um, and that's where, again, with Ireland, you know, going back to Ireland, they, their, their forwards have got a relatively good short passing game, which gave them a point of difference. Mm. And bloody hard to defend yeah, against as well. Very hard, mate. And it, te- it brings in that um, mental fatigue. Yeah. We've got physical yeah, fatigue, yeah. but there's n- nothing harder than having to think for 80 minutes of a game. Yeah. Because everybody's prepared to play physical for 80 minutes, yeah. or most are. Yeah. You know, you know when you're going to yeah. go off, but not many teams prepare for, you know, yeah. an emotional and mental yeah. 80 minutes. Yeah. And that's where that, yeah. that passing and that point yeah. of difference yeah. comes in and challenges yeah. your decision making. Yeah. And yeah, mental fatigue makes cowards of us yeah. all. It really yeah. does. Yeah. Um, after J- Japan, you came to England in 2015. Sam Burgess, would you have loved to have coached him and? Was that? Can you talk to us about that? Was there any crossover there? So I know he played in the World Cup in '15. You signed with England not so long after that. Was there any of those discussions to try and keep him in the sport? Uh, he'd already gone, mate. By the time I got there, um, but yeah, he's like you just look at him. He's a winner, isn't he? He's a winner everywhere he goes. He makes the team win, mm. and it's tough. Skillful, but they stuffed him up in rugby. They didn't play in two positions. Like no one in rugby plays forward and back because it's too hard. So he was playing six for his club and and 12 for England. Like it was just ridiculous to ask someone changing sports to play two positions where no one in rugby plays two positions. So they made it really difficult for him. And again, you know, when you're not a cohesive country, imagine if England, England, if England had kept Sam Burgess, we could, who knows? We could have won the World Cup in 2009 who knows? You, you, re- you really think well, he, he would have he, been that he's influential? He's a substantial player, like substantial player. You know, you just watch what he does. And and if he if he had one position in, in rugby, was playing that for his club and playing for, for the nation, you don't know what difference he could make. Like I'm not saying we would have won the World Cup with him, but I'm saying that potentially he could have been a, a point of difference. Like Jason Robinson in 2003, mate, with England. Like before they had Jason Robinson, they were a fairly solid team, but Jason Robinson gave them them this X factor Mm. that you couldn't coach against because you didn't know when he was coming in the back line. He didn't know. Like and they're the the players that that you stay up at night and you think, how are we going to close this bloke down? You know, and you know there's no there's no mm. real way to close him down. You just got to get everyone to do their job. And just like you were saying, like everyone does their job for eighty minutes, but it only takes one minute not to do it, and he slips through. So he he made a difference, and and that's where you know a guy like Sam Burgess can make a difference to a team. Did you make a phone call to him at all? He'd already gone. Mate. He, he definitely yeah, already yeah, gone. Already gone. And there was a bit of sour relationships between. Him and the rugby at that stage. You know, I've caught up to him a few times since. Um, but it was just, it was too late, mate. Yeah. Where would you have played him? Oh, 12. 12. It's hard for a rug, rugby league forward to play in the forwards in rugby. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, so if they're a fast back row or a good back row, they can play 12 in, in, in rugby union. Yeah. It's, um, I'd have loved to have, seen him spend a, a, a little bit longer there i probably didn't understand the the intricacies of going from forwards to back and how nobody in rugby does it so yeah. then why is why is he doing it? I, I would have loved to have seen him yeah no, he would have been massive mate you, know, we, you understand how the press can make or break you and yeah. one minute you're the hero next minute you're the villain yeah. like geez he got a an awful time yeah, no, no, no. They hung him out to dry a bit, mate, and that's where you know it would have been hard to get him back. In in, in any case, um, yeah. do, do you think the coaches at the time should have taken more responsibility to that? No, no. Obviously, I've seen the, the the Beckham documentary recently, where you know Ferguson goes into bat for his players, and even like yourself, you you put yourself out there, 
and you took all the heat prior to the World mm. Cup, you know, it was Eddie Jones, you know, not there was no focus on the players, mm. focus on you. Do you think perhaps the, the coaching staff at the time should have done a better job and and took more responsibility? Well, again, you, you know, you've got this situation where you've got the club fighting with the country. Yeah. You know, and, and you know, if England, England are a powerhouse of, of world rugby, you know, they're consistently up there because they've got a strong domestic comp. But if they can get a line, because one of the things I was pushing for there was central contracting. Get, but they, they're bringing that in now. Well, they oh. are now. So sometimes you don't get the fruits of your, yeah. your labour, mate. Yeah, so the two years post that, now they're starting to bring it in. What, what, what does that entail? Well, that means that like a Sam Burgess, he's on a national contract, right? He plays for, so he plays for Bath and you can tell him to play 12. Ah, uh, so they, so, that's so the more, pa more yeah. power to yeah. the Yeah, yeah. To the but RFU. you're working together. You're working yeah, together. It's in t yeah. But, you know, you got Sam Burgess playing six for Bath and 12 for the country. It's just ridiculous. And if you could get him playing 12 all the time, or it might be that you need to change a player's position, you know. So then you're working with the club to give that player the experience to change that position. Yeah. Hey, how was it for you when you took over the England team? Because I think you were the first ever non-English First and last, mate, I think. <laughs> <You're right. laughs> was it hard to be accepted or or you you felt okay? Uh, it was pretty easy, mate, in a, in a lot of ways because like England, you know, you've got you've got the big public school system, private school system, and then you've got the non public school and they tend to be quite segmented. Um, so coming as an outsider was I didn't have any association with anyone, so it was easy for me to come in, um, and they'd been through a bad period. Like, yeah, you know, generally you take over a team, you don't take over a team in its prime. No, you take it over in a in a period where it needs some renovation, needs some rebuilding, so, and they were, and they were a good bunch of players, mate. Like really good bunch of players, and we had a a group of about six or seven from Saracens who were the strongest side in Europe at that stage. So they were, they formed the basis of the team. So, you know, you had to work hard to get those players on board. And I'd, I'd, I'd had an association with Saris. I'd done some work a long time ago for them. So I, we had a good association there. So it was easy to come in, give them fresh hope. You know, they'd been embarrassed at a home World Cup. So they were ready to go. So that was, that was, that was pretty, uh, Pretty easy to change, you know. They we just got a bit fitter, went back to England identity, went back to their game, and then quietly moved that game a little bit away from that for the World Cup in two thousand nineteen. How, how do you go with? You've got you, Eddie Jones, the, the coach, and you'd have your principles, but England and Australia, having lived in both countries, having worked in both countries and played in both countries. We're very same, but we're also worlds apart. Yeah. Now you've been in Japan as well. How do you go bouncing around from those different cultures and different attitudes of players? Is, is, is that is that a challenge for you? So when you go into the the England dressing room, having, you know, coached in Australia, coached in Japan, did you have to, did you go in with a openness or was this is what I'm. This is what's got success before, and despite our cultural differences, you're going to get in line. I've always got an idea of what I want to do, um, and I, one of the most interesting discussions I've ever had with a coach was with Lou Van Gaal, right? So he didn't know me from a bar of soap, right? And anyway, the the League Managers Association. Uh, I did some work for them and there was a lady there called Sue McKellar who'd say, who would you like to meet? Who would you like to meet? And so she organised for me to, to meet Louis van Gaal at Amsterdam Airport. <laughs> so, right, this, and he knows nothing about rugby. You know, he's a big guy, comes in beautiful cashmere. I can still remember her, okay, beautiful cashmere pink sweater, you know, uh, nice chino pants, Gucci shoes, you know, beautiful pinstripe shirt. And he sits down and he and we're talking and and again he knows nothing. And I remember talking to him because you know you look at his coaching experience; it's incredible what he's done. And he had this beautiful way of describing. He said, "So you think of the game like this, 
you go to a team and then you quickly work out what shape you've got to play to, to get them mm. to be effective. And then at the same time, you're always trying to move them towards what you want to do. And that's, that's basically the process. But the way he described it was so succinct. And then the, the funny thing was he kept on touching me on the arm and I thought, yeah, I couldn't quite work it out. He said, but you've got to remember, relationships is everything in coaching. He said, I'm trying to establish a relationship with you now. And he was. He was, real, he was bloody brilliant. Like just the way he described, you know, how you come up with a playing style for your team at that time. You, you've got an idea, but then you work out with the players what they're good at and then mm. you try to craft a team. Because if you're a football manager, you, work, you, you come in on a Monday, you might have to ch play the team on the Saturday, you know, mm. you know when they come in. Because, again, they only take over sides that aren't doing well. And then, you know, obviously, you know, it sums up what coaching's about. You're trying to establish relationships all the time. You're trying to have a good feel, just like we're trying mm. to do now. Did, did you know? Did you notice the difference between the Japanese players, the English players, the, the Australian players? Oh, massively, mate. And they're usually the, – the big thing is how hard they work at the game, how hard independently they work at the game. Like there's, there's massively difference in now around the world in rugby in that area, like massive differences. Because, again, if you're in an intense competition – you got to keep working at your game hard. Like if you're an NRL player and you're a winger and you can't catch a high ball, you're not going to survive, eh? No. You're not going to play. So that drives the necessity to work hard. And you find there's big differences in work ethic in in players. There's in, big in, in in oh, I think there's big differences in work ethics between individuals. But you did you notice it from a a countrywide perspective? Yeah. Yeah. England England players because of the comp they play in, the European comp is pretty hard. You know, it's pretty – they work really hard at their game and they're, they're independent in how they work at their game. Uh, yeah. As in they take they take ownership yeah, of it. They, they take, don't need to yeah, be prodded. They to don't need to be told what to do. Yeah, and then you've got someone like Owen Farrell who's, who's at his game, you know. He's, he's at it the whole time. He's just a driver. So you've got that role model there mm. and tends to flow down. And they're a really hard-working team. Like Australia, Australian, when I reckon when we first started professional rugby, we were the hardest-working country in the world because we are able to model ourselves off rugby league and AFL, which, you know, you look at the success of NRL and AFL, it's because the players work so bloody hard, you know, and the standards so good. Yeah, for domestic comps, they're unbelievable, aren't they, mm. NRL and AFL. And so we were able to borrow that initially and we won the World Cup in 99 because of that, you know, and, and we've probably tailed off a little bit now and that's an area that can improve. Um, and then J Japanese are just a different, they're different, mate. They're different. Uh, again, just quick story. So we had a camp in 2015. It was basically all of June. So we had 30 days. I think we gave them like three days off. It was, it was nuts, right? Like, a, like a, a, a camp going into a World competition Cup. or yeah. going into the World, World Cup. Cup, right? Okay. We had 30 days. It was hot, humid, like 30 degrees. And we, there was a fullback there, Goromaru. Um, we had three days off, so we encouraged them to, to go home and see their families. Um, he didn't. He wanted to stay in camp. He said, if I, if I go home, I'll lose focus. I want to stay focused. This is important. You know, because because at that, before that World Cup, Japan had been a joke team. You know, they hadn't won a World Cup game for 24 years. Their average score against a, a tier one country was 85 nil defeat. And, and there was a group of players there, senior players like we were talking about before, that wanted to change Japanese rugby so they knew how important it was. And so... They're completely dedicated to their craft, Japanese players. And so you, 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 you try to work out, right. Do you have to pull them back a little bit then? Well, sometimes you do, mate. Sometimes you do. And I remember, and again, going back to that tactical periodization, one of the things they always said is don't get greedy. Like don't overtrain the players. And I remember going to a session and, you know, you go to a session and the players are slow out. You know, they're sitting around, you know they're tired. Like there's, mm. there's all body language things. And so I said, right, boys, we're not training today. 
And I had players in tears. Wow. Because they wanted to train. And then we didn't train. And the next day, mate, we trained at such an intensity. And it was incredible. And it just reinforced the fact that sometimes you've got to pull them back. Yeah. Hold them back. Yeah. Um, mate, you mentioned there about Australia um, and their players not working hard enough. Yeah. Or, the- or- they just just need more initiative to do it themselves. Like you know, when you got a good team, they're doing it themselves. Yeah, you're not, you're yeah, not you prodding. don't need to. And that's that's the, the in the course of the World Cup, they they really improved a lot. And yeah. I reckon the group of players that Australia's got now will take that forward. And I don't think that'll be a problem going forward. Yeah, but I think you know when you get comfortable, mate. That's when you stop working hard. Absolutely, yes. Yeah. Absolutely, it is. Um, mate, when, when you s- spoke about um, Japanese rugby union and their uh, um, poor record against tier one teams, that r- rugby league is a growing sport. Well, we're trying to grow into new markets. I look at countries like 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 France, which I think could really benefit from some investment. We have our World Cup, and often people will laugh about the the teams, the countries that are represented. And I look back to rugby union and I, I point the example of Argentina, yeah. of Italy and Japan that would be ridiculed in 99, like some cricket scores, like legitimate cricket scores, but they turn that around. Is that something you think rugby league neglects? Like that, that ability to, it, almost face those embarrassing losses because I, I, I don't understand we, why we don't go bigger on the international game. Well, I think, you know, if you look at the history of league in Australia, the Super League, Super League NRL battle then set forth the NRL into this fantastic competition, you know, and it mm. hasn't looked back. And I think now that they've got their backyard right and you can see it now you know there's more tests being played there's more encouragement of Tonga Fiji and and Samoa particularly that I think now's the time that they can expand shit I wouldn't mind being the next Japanese or the first Japanese rugby league coach that'd be all right wouldn't it wouldn't it just well <laughs> Matt just speaking we'll get to you, you on the well Matt I, I'm mind ticking over in this interview and thinking about what you could do for a country like France and rugby league, yeah. and you know, a, a team that's perhaps probably underperformed, but with a, a lot of potential, a lot of upside. Yeah, you know, you've got the Catalan Dragons there. Toulouse just missed out on promotion. Like, what a person like you could do for yeah. French. Well, I, know, I know Trent Robinson's been he's been doing a fair bit yeah. there, but again, they they they've got problems with their administration. Mm. They need to sort out their administration. Mm. But I think you know Trent's. Trent's pretty uh, it, keen he, to help there. He does a great job, yeah. but obviously his main yeah. focus is, you know, the demands of a grueling NRL season, pre-season with the, with the Roosters. But I just, yeah, I'm thinking someone like yourself to go over there and take over would be... Sounds like fun, mate. Amazing, <laughs> amazing. Has, has Rook been in coaching ever been... Um, on your, on oh, your I'd radar? Lo- I'd love to do it, mate. I had a bit of a... With Wigan, back with Wigan, they uh, wanted me to come up and have a chat to them about being director of of rugby. When, uh, when was this? This was maybe 2007, 2008, okay. and get Andy Andy Farrell on as a head coach. So it was just a preliminary chat, but the bloke wanted me to come up and have a chat, and then my wife said no, and I'm, I'm not living up in Wigan. <laughs> <laughs> Well, London, London she's was obviously a very smart woman. <laughs> London, London was cold enough for her. Yeah. Um, and then, yeah, there's been bits and pieces where there's been sort of again, you know, people talking. Would you be interested? Would you like to have a look at this? Um, but the timing's never been right. Mm. But you know, I grew up, mate, from the age of five. I watched. I used to go to every South game. One year, I went to every game, every every ground. And, you know, in those days you used to have third grade at 12 o'clock, second grade, yeah. and loved it, mate. Full knew, day. Knew every player and they absolutely loved it. And South is still my love, you know. 
I, I, I'm really proud how they're doing now and, and doing so well. Yeah, well, South Surf team, I had a bit of a rivalry with. Yeah. So, yeah, that, yeah. I'll, I'll let you off. <laughs> I'll let you off. Um, mate, one of the, um, the 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 big things about coaching is, is rivalries. Um, and I've been looking at the, the rivalry that you had with uh, Sir Clive Woodward and perhaps still have. Is that, is that something you enjoy? Uh, not really, but again... I just don't think you know people can say things without without being being uh, you got to be forthright about what you think. Um, yeah, and he he's he hasn't coached since two thousand five. You know, and and he's the world's best coach. You know, you're the world's best coach when you don't coach. You know, it's, <laughs> a, it's a man in you know what's the old thing? The man in the arena is yes. the only one that's got a got a right to have is a that say. Roosevelt. Yeah, I think so. Mm. And you know, he's consistently criticizing and and we had a bit of a thing when we were England and and Australia coach, but he's he's great gripe, mate. He wanted to be director of, of rugby at, at England. And he wanted to oversee and he never got that job. And in, after the World Cup in two thousand nineteen he he ran a ran a internal campaign with the RFU to take that position and and I, and he did it behind my back and I thought it was really sort of quite sneaky and mm. deceitful. So every time since, you know, if he says something, I, I really don't value his his thoughts at all and I don't like him as a bloke. So Oh really yeah. it's it's got that Yeah, yeah because he was just, so it, because he was so deceitful, mate. Yeah, you know, most blokes yeah. Most blokes in in our sport, in the rugby leagues, I'm sure the same. They're generally face to face, mm. you know. And I don't mind that if someone has a different opinion, say it, like say it, and we'll have a debate about it. But when people start doing things behind your back, and particularly the power that he had in the media, I thought it was a bit red hot. Yeah, because I think, like you know, most personal battles yeah. on the field, you see boxers and MMA fighters go after it, but you know. The overwhelming majority of the time after the the battle, yeah. it's yeah, good good on you there. I I, I trained harder because yeah. you were on the field. Yeah. Like I, I I pushed myself, yeah. but for for you guys, it was that. Yeah, well, I think he made it personal, mate, mm. by doing all that stuff behind the scenes. And yeah, he'll he'll deny it to the to the hilt. Um, but I, I always find it a bit sad, and I I hope. That when I do finish coaching, I don't become one of those blokes, mm. you know, that knows everything. Should you know, he should have done this. He should have made the change here. Like you know, coaching and playing is about foresight, isn't it? You know, you're yeah. trying to predict what's happening. You know, being a pundit's all about hindsight. And you always, you always. <laughs> what are you saying about? Yeah. Yeah. You're always right, aren't oh, you? Well, you're always right. I'm a coach without a team. <laughs> yeah, coach all 17 teams in the NRL at the moment. <laughs> How I'll be doing this. Yeah, uh, well, it, it, it's true, but yeah. um, yeah, the the man in the arena, um, Ruse of, I think is it? I can't remember. Yeah, Ruse of. I, I've I've looked at that poem quite often. Yeah. And it's something I used to draw back to when I was playing. It's like, and well, it's very true, mate. It's it like is. A, it's like a player. Like yeah, a player, yeah, you've got well, the guts I'd, to get out yeah. there and play. I'll you take know. all the criticism because yeah. I'm yeah. here. Yeah, and I'll I'll fall here. I'd be I'd rather die wondering. Sorry, not die wondering than just be the one. Yeah, chipping in. So yeah, yeah. Oh. Um, that might be Clive now. Yeah. <laughs> um, I've got to ask. So, uh, a friend of the show, Wendell Saylor, um, he's he's helped <laughs> organise this video. Uh, sort of organise this video. Organise this uh, th this podcast. How was Big Dell? Mate, he, he was again. You know, he would talk about the effect of league blokes. He was fantastic. Really good. Trained hard. Character off the field. Oh, jeez. Yeah. Bigger than Ben Hur off the field. Um, but really good. The boys loved him, mate. Boys loved yeah. him. Yeah, you know, he was good value. And he played that semi final against New Zealand where, you know, you're talking about inside shoulders. He cut him inside shoulders around the ruck, got us on the front foot. And he was a big man. Um, yeah, you can't help but like him. Yeah, he's. 
he's lovable guy, isn't yeah. he? He he really is. Was there any um when he were there any times you had to sort of like pull him back into line, not get not let him get ahead of himself? I always remember because he li- he liked feedback, mate. Yeah, I always remember one game he he hadn't had such a good game, and uh, I deliberately avoided him for a couple of days, and he hated it. You could see because he was dying. He, all he wanted to say, say to him was that, Wendell, you weren't too flashed on Saturday, mate. Yeah, and then he'd, then he'd come out of himself. But for him not knowing was, you know, you just, you just, just needed not to talk to him for a while to, to have the effect on him. And he yeah. comes out and he trains well and plays well the next week. Yeah, well, I, I, I can only imagine there was a multitude of, of stories and every every day with Dell is an interesting yeah. day, put it that way. And I can only imagine what he was like when he was playing. Um yeah, what a character. Um you to the future. Uh I guess technically unemployed. Unemployed, mate. Um have you signed on yet or are you um <laughs> not yet. Not yet. Well still coaching ambitions? Uh yeah, well yeah I'd like to Given the disappointment of this job, like, you know, and I've decided it's probably the first time I've decided I just need to sit back now. You know, I've, I've been basically coaching consistently since 96. I'm just going to sit back. Uh, and if someone offers me a job, I'll have to make sure it's the right job. Um, and if it is, then I'll, I'll give it a go. I'd like to keep catching internationally. I don't think I want to go back and catch club. Um, and if there's not, then I've been a consultant for Suntory in Japan since 1996. So it's, a, it's the longest relationship ever. So I'll go back. I'll start doing a bit with them in, in Japan um, and then just wait and see, mate. You know what I'm going to ask, right? Lions. Chance? No. No interest, mate. Not at all? No. No. I liked English. I like coaching English. I've got no time for the rest of them. And it was a funny thing at the Barbarians, right? Well, oh, sorry, no time for the rest of them, as in like the Welsh, the Scots, yeah, yeah. and the Irish. Yeah. No time for them. No time. Ta- oh, yes. <laughs> Poor Eddie Jones. Well okay. done. And again, so you, you, you've said what I've been thinking for years. <laughs> at the Barbarians. So they had the jersey presentation, you know, and. They got a Welsh Welsh baggage man who's a magistrate, like, but he he does the gear stew, stew for the barbarians, just loves it, you know. Mm. And he said, "We've got a special award today." He said, uh, "For Eddie, I've got a I've got a little trophy for you." So anyway, he had a plastic poo right with a <laughs> Welsh flag. And written on it, this is not a shitty country. Because <laughs> apparently, you know, at some stage, yeah, I went to some sort of commercial thing for someone and someone asked me a quick question. I said, yeah, well, she's just a little shitty country, just as a laugh and became this hysterical thing. And so, um, but I've got no time. Like having coached England, I don't want to have any association with Ireland, Wales or, or Scotland. Mm. Yeah, you know, I feel quite, I feel like I'd be a, a, a trader to, to, <laughs> go, to go to those countries. And so I've got no interest oh, in the Lions. Yeah, let's, let's, anybody listening that's not taking out of context, um, Japan, an option? Uh, we'll see. Because you're, we'll you're very close with the, is it the um, the president? Yeah, like he was he was the first Suntory coach that uh, I had an association with. So, and that's probably a bit of a stumbling block, you know, because he wants to, he wants to run his own race. Uh, he doesn't want to be associated of, of favouritism, so I will just wait and see, mate. See what yeah. we'll see what comes out in the wash. Is there a time frame on it, or just? Uh, I reckon they'll do something in the next couple of months, so yeah. we'll just wait and see. Mm. But I'm not I'm not rushing to get a job at the moment. Mm. I always get fascinated by coaches and their um, their mentality. Well, why keep going back for more? Oh, because I love it, mate. I love the game. Like, yeah, you know, just talking to you out there today and just made me think, shit, I can coach that area better. You know, just what do you mean? I, I'm, you not, know, <laughs> I'm saying you, you're looking at me saying I'm not good enough. You'd coach no, it. No, no, no. <laughs> saying, like, you know, just, just you know, you can you can keep learning so much. And the, what you said is not new things, but it's just a reminder of mm. of how important that detail of the game 
Yeah, you know, and I want to create a team that can play that short passing game. Yeah, you know, I want to. You want to play a game that no one else is playing, and I reckon there's always that. It's like a boxer, isn't it? Like heavyweight boxer, mm. like they keep going back, don't they? Well, I, yeah, and I knew what it was like to to, to be an athlete. Yeah. To always want to just yeah. keep getting. And after. there's always something better there. Always something better mm. you can do, and you know, for coaching, and I see, you know, I'm, you see with Wayne Bennett, he's seventy three, whatever he is. And he's st- you can see he still loves it, doesn't he? Mm. You know, in his uh, his own way, and he's he's shown everyone he can do it at the Dolphins. Like you know, after probably for him, you know, the the period at the Broncos was probably a massive disappointment for him. You know, a bit like for me with Australia now. You know, it didn't work out the way I wanted, and so he's shown everyone at the Dolphins he can do it. Well, he went back to Sa- he went yeah. to Sal's, took them to a grand final. Dolphins, not much yeah. expectation overachieved but it's just it, it fascinates me that that those type of people that just you know obviously you can pinpoint your highlights but there's some t- long tough yeah. hours yeah and this you get publicly ridiculed you, know, you get abused by fans so you're getting into a taxi getting abused by mm. some, some scots as well <laughs> no wonder you don't like them um but yeah it's just interesting to see why yeah. you what's behind the the, the the love for the for the game. Well, I think the game itself. Like I, I love rugby and I love rugby league. Like yeah, you know, if I could sit the whole weekend and watch every game, I'd watch it. Mm. Yeah, you know, I love it. And I love that physical contest. You know, coming out of you know we were brought up at La Perouse, uh working class family, and rugby league was the way we all started. You know, mm. and and it's sort of in your blood. You know, and it's it's I don't know. It's just I want to I want to coach a team that can play differently than everyone else. Mm. That's really interesting. I'm looking forward to seeing how you go in your next role, especially after our conversation here. Um, I spoke about some of the differences between league union, the the, the crossover. Uh, we were talking just uh, before off air about about concussion and the management of it. So. Rugby Union have come down r- really hard, and it's clear that the um, the referees that referees the law lo- that interpret the laws of the game um, with the TMO, it's anything round the head. It's it, it's sending off, and they've they did introduce hip and below. Oh, even the, 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 in it, local, but, but in, it's uh, nipple line now. Yeah. In rugby, yeah. What what have you made of of those changes? Well, I think I think you know as we spoke off here, I think it's made the game safer. Yeah. But I also think the contradiction is that now we've got greater TMO intervention, and and mm. because of that, we're encouraging bigger bodies to play the game. You know, if you if you look at rugby, it's almost like a three phase version of NFL, with little tiny pockets of of soccer where you get the transition. But you've got this three-phase ball in plays average 32 seconds. 32 seconds. So it's a power game. Mm-hmm. You know, and the more powerful we make the game, the more dangerous it is. Yeah. You know, so we need to need to find some way to say, right, TMO is important. Like if it was me, I'd just have TMO, absolute red card come in. If it's not yeah. absolute red card, if the referee hasn't seen it play on. Like, and I know that'll that'll cause problems, but I reckon we've got to get some some continuity in the game so it encourages little guys to keep playing. Well, and and that could be look if the overarching goal is to reduce the number of um, high contacts, concussions, repetitive um, head injuries, degenerative brain issues further down the track. We might have to make a decision that on the surface looks like it's detrimental to yeah. the cause, but it's actually what it's going to yeah. do. The, it's short-term pain for long-term gain, right? Yeah, 100%. Yeah. Good do, way of saying it. Do, do you make much of, of, of Lee's change? Do, do you think they've changed uh, enough? I have seen some positive change, but... Well, I thought towards the end of the season they were a lot harder on it. I thought initially at the start of the season it was a, it was a little bit loose, mate, wasn't it? Uh, <laughs> And then you had the grand final where, you know, we sp- spoke about the, the, the Penrith lock. Yeah, Isaiah, he, yeah. He probably shouldn't have come back on. 
like on the on the surface of it. Like, and again, you don't know, you don't know the mm. backstory, but certainly, I think league are, are getting in the right direction. Um, mm. You know, and for league, it's always been because it's such a physical game and almost like Origin recreated league, and it was Origin was just do your best one that like. Yeah, basically do your best. And now that that's been pulled back and I think the game's moving in the right direction, mate. You know, we, we've spoke about almost code wars, you know, and, and a little bit of the battle between league, union, AFL, with with the threat of some of the litigation and, and, and things around concussion, could we be missing the... Missing the the way to get either a, comp- a, a competitive advantage or these games just become obsolete and soccer just takes over. Is that is that a concern of yours or or not? No, because I think you know people like to see gladiators, don't they? You know, and and what we've got to just make sure we do is is, is make the game safe enough for gladiators because because people make a choice to play league or union, they make a choice to play league or union, and I think if we make the game safe enough, which Definitely in rugby and, and rugby leagues moving towards it, then there's there's always going to be a place for gladiatorial sports. You know we're combative, we're combative people. You know we fight for territories. You know you just got to look at what's happening in the world. People are fighting for territory all the time. You know it's in our it's in our nature. So I think there's always going to be a, a, a special place for it. Yeah. On the um, the flip side of gladiatorial nature, who's the most talented player that you've coached? Uh, is there anybody that? Uh, there's a South African halfback, Free Dupree. Like he was, he looked like a professional golfer, right? <laughs> Skinny, uh, no muscle, but his ability to see the game. I've never seen a bloke see the game as quickly as him. He had a beautiful pass, great kicking game, won the World Cup in 2007 with South Africa. Beautiful player. Cool. Um, well, mate, we do uh, a couple of questions for, for each and every guest, which we've preempted you about. Uh, the first one is all thanks to Tui's. Tui's are all about teamwork, and every great team needs a spine. So, this is a little bit difficult for you, but a dream spine. Uh, and happy for you to use players from either code, but your uh, dream spine of a one, six, seven, and nine, please. <laughs> I'd have happy at nine. <laughs> Coruscant. Yeah, I love him as a player. Uh, one I'd have uh, Joe Roth, so I'll mix it up a bit. Six, is it? Six? Yeah. Six, uh, Steve Larkham. Seven, Joey Johns. Have I got anyone else? No, that's right. That's it. That's not bad. So you got Roth at fullback, Larkin at six, Joey at seven, what it could have been. Jeez, and Happy Chorus out at nine. With the – this is going to – Come into a, into the next question about Joey. What what that could have been? Yeah, no. The sliding always, doors. Always, like, always think about yeah. about because I ended up getting a sack. I think in two thousand five with Australia. Mm. And if he had played, who knows? Yeah. All right. Well, that's our dream spine. All thanks to Tui's. Like we say, Tui's are all about teamwork, and each team needs a great spine. So thank you for that. But then now, time for the three questions for each and every guest. Yeah. If either football code didn't exist, what do you think you'd be doing? I'd be a school teacher, mate. So really? Spe- I, I specialist was a, subject? I was PE, geography and, and lower level maths. I was a, I was a good lower level maths teacher because I used to make it entertaining for the kids. Because when I initially started teaching, I was a, you were a casual teacher because uh, there wasn't any jobs in the eastern suburbs and you'd always go to a school and you'd get the bottom, bottom maths class, usually year nine boys. Yeah, you because know, that's, that's the day that the teacher wants off. I <laughs> uh, became a bit of an expert catching year nine boys' maths. But basic <laughs> math. But what was the term you used um, about maths? Simp- not simple maths, basic, lower maths? Lower level maths. Lower yeah. level maths. I just used to make it fun for the kids. But uh, and when I look back, it really helped me coaching because you'd go in there as a casual teacher and you quickly have to work out, right, I've got to keep him quiet, he might help me. I've got to watch this group there. And it's, you know, just the same as a team. You, you go in and you work out, right, he's going to help me, he's going to be a problem. Mm. How am I going to sort him out? Mm. All right. Well, both my parents were teachers by trade, so. Um, but, yeah, I used to – was a bad kid. But not a bad kid. Bad kid. 
Um, used to ask a lot of questions, yeah. but it was distracting. <laughs> That's why you're good at this, mate. Yeah, yeah. Hey, <laughs> maths teacher, do you know the birthday problem? Birthday problem, no. Mm. So if I've got 17 random people in the same room, what's the probability that two of those people share a birthday? Five, sixty, one out of sixty-five. It's fifty percent. Fifty percent is it? Look it up. The birthday problem. There you go. It's always like it's always something I. That's what I'm telling you. I was a bad yeah. math teacher, mate. <laughs> it's to do with uh, the number of possibilities. It's All a right. possibility problem, right. but. Anyway, that's uh, something for you to enjoy on the way home. <laughs> uh, a sliding doors moment that you. Uh, that you, you, you think about the alternative happening? Uh, well, it's probably, uh, I remember sitting down at, it was about a month before the World Cup in for Japan in 2015, and I'd just signed for another four years for them. And I, I, at that stage, I was, I was exhausted. Like, we'd, we'd, you know, I told you about the camps, we'd trained really hard, put a lot into it. I thought, I don't know whether I can do another four years. Um, so I rang up my manager and I said, I'm, I'm gonna pull the pin here. Um, and they were quite, they were good about it. Um, and then ended up, and I said, I wanna coach in South Africa because I wanted to do something different. So got the job at Stormers, everyone super rugby, went over there, had one month, one, team meeting, one training session and was loving it, you know, like coaching South African players, loving it. And then I got a phone call, England got knocked out of the World Cup and the CEO said he wants to come down. So he flew down Saturday morning. We sat at, at you've been to Cape Town? Uh, no, not to Cape it's Town. It's one of the no. most beautiful places. We were in the harbour and tabletop mountains sitting there and sitting there and he's talking about coaching England. Um, anyway, we had a good chat, um, and they rang me back on the Monday and gave me the job. And I just, I, I was loving what I was doing at the Stormers, mm. and I thought, shit, you know, because I had no, no desire to coach England. Um, but then I thought, this is just too good not to, not to go to. So I had to put... Baseball cap, sunglasses off, and sneaked out of the country on the Tuesday. Far went, out. went there with summer wardrobe from Cape Town, <laughs> and then coached England for seven years. So it was that you know, it was a it was a period where I basically just had to had to. I felt terrible leaving the Stormers. Yeah. Terrible. Yeah, it's fun. I guess that's the, the some opportunities. Just well, you got to you got to take them. Yeah, yeah. Hey, just I uh, probably. Didn't touch on enough before we get into the, the last question. With your tenure at Japan, what was it like when you beat the South Africans? That loops us back in quite nicely. Oh, I remember. There's a, there's a movie about yeah, that yeah. result, right? Like, it's incredible like what sport can do. Yeah, no, no. I remember we had, uh, with Michael Leach, the captain, a great bloke, we went to coffee. Say this is a Starbucks in Tokyo, all right? And we having coffee just after it. Then we go outside and someone recognises him and then it was like Beatlemania. Really? They were lined up and we must have spent 45 minutes signing autographs to get out of the place. Like, so you went from a country that had no history in rugby to a country that then, you know, Leach, Leach now he's like he's got beer commercials, noodles commercials, everything, you know. He's an absolute superstar there. Um, so to have that change on the country and now young kids there think they can beat the world, you know, mm. so you're giving them hope, you made rugby popular, it's a, it's a good feeling. Yeah. And but that's, you know, ultimately, you know, Australia will go through that again here and I hope this team we took to the World Cup will do that in 2027. Yeah, I probably, you know, when I was um, reading about it, you didn't realise the significance of that, yeah. that, that victory and how that can be the catalyst for so much positive change and those young kids that look up and go, wow, like 
I can be like that. We don't need to get beaten a hundred nil. So yeah, imagine well, Japan Rugby League team beats the Kangaroos, mate. Well, <laughs> it, who knows? It, it, it is it. It's not impossible. Well, I'll give him a ring when I get back to the office. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> last question. I'll get the horse guy to help me. Yeah. <laughs> the horse guy. Uh, last question. The most interesting person you've met along the way. By the way, you said about Guardiola. Before we go, yeah. you met Pep Guardiola yeah. as well. Can you, can you, sorry, yeah, I, I cut in about the uh, the periodization train. God, Pep Guardiola. Yeah. What, what, well, I, he, was, I, he was fantastic, mate. He, um, they had training in the morning. They've got this set up at Bayern Munich where they've got a public ground. They do all their warm-up. So any punter in, in Munich can come up and watch them do their warm-up, right? It's, it's for, so, for, for practice. For practice. Then they've got a enclosed, completely enclosed where they do all their tactical work. What, what a brilliant idea. Brilliant idea. So anyone can come and watch them do their warm-up. So they do their warm-up for 20 minutes and they go and do their tactical work. So he, you know, he's a sought after man. He's and he's got this right hand man, a water polo guy, Manuel. He said, "No, he'll see you. Don't worry." Uh, he said, "You just might have to wait." So I had to wait till seven o'clock, and then we sat there for three hours and just spoke about coaching. It was fantastic. And he's, you know, how you see him on the television. He's mm. exactly like that: enthusiastic, engaging, loves the game, loves the game. So he was good. Uh, the other ones. You know, you just said you watched Beckham, so Alex Ferguson. We had him a couple of times um, in for England and then I had lunch with him a couple of times. Like just tough, hard, but you could tell he, he knew people. And, he's, you know, one of the things he said, he, he made sure he organised his office so he could see players getting out of their cars. You know, he was a great student of people, you know, and... The players said tactically he wasn't fantastic, but he, you know, in football he could manage the people. And, you know, you saw on the Beckham how, you know, he thought Beckham was getting too big for his boots. So see you later. You know, it's fascinating that. So firstly on the Bayern Munich, training is available to everyone, so that keeps you grounded. Yeah. And sometimes those voices that tell you what you don't want, maybe... It's not what you want to hear, but what you need to know. Yeah. Um, but also that connection to the community yeah. that we're, th this is who we yeah. play for here. Yeah. yeah, it's brilliant. Hey, it's 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 by design. There's again, I always look at this. There's more to yeah. it than meets the yeah. eye. There's a reason why yeah. they do that. Yeah. You don't have to do it because you, as a coach, might be thinking, "Oh, we need to be yeah. super secret." What what happens if you, you know Bayern Leverkusen send yeah. their yeah. chief scout and yeah. he's filming yeah. like? Well, it's all right. Yeah. We got this. Is the greater good comes from that? And then for a guy like Sarah Alex Ferguson, he wants to see how they're coming in every day yeah. without them, yeah. without them being, you know, oh, hey gaffer, yeah. Yeah. hey, it's yeah. no, how are they, yeah. how are they getting out? Yeah. It's fascinating that yeah. sort of stuff. It's little things to the yeah. environment that can make a huge change. Yeah. Oh, sorry, a, not a huge change, a huge difference in either a playing group. Um, or, or that one-on-one -on -one relationship individual. It's it's fascinating. I did. I, I read a little bit about Saracens, and you spoke yeah. about how successful they were. I read that one of the, one of the um, the environmental changes they made in the training ground was they put in a crèche. Yeah, yeah. And they managed to keep their top yeah. players because of the environment that they created day to day, where they would get. Um, significantly higher offers from foreign clubs, but they chose to stay because they made the environment better. They used to, apparently, they used to have toys there full of pound notes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, is, that what, is that what it comes? They got done for the salary cow. Only <laughs> joke. Only joke. <laughs> but yeah, no, no. But hundred percent. You know, and again, success leaves clues all the time. Yes, it does. And, and you'll pick that up brilliantly with those observations about. And you meet those coaches, it's very rarely it's something new. It's just a different way of looking at something. Mm. And you just find different ways of looking. Like, you know, I know just from that conversation with Sir Alex, and I, I probably did it anyway, I always sit in a team room for, for meals and I'll try to make sure I can see everyone. 
because you just that, you, so that's that's you, that's your yeah, thing. Yeah, it's just picking up. You know who's sitting with who, how are they looking, how are they eating. Yeah, you're just trying to pick up little bits and pieces of information all the time. Always on. Yeah. That cool. see, that's almost like going, why going to coach because. Like and I know speaking to coaches that they're, they're not really in the conversation. Well, even you, right. you're eating your meal, but you're not. Yeah. You you're working. Yeah. It's cra- it's crazy. That's the level, the depth that you go to. It, was there a particular way that you'd get the staff to shape the tables? Uh, we'd have them in force. Try to have them in force because again, you got four people sitting here. You can keep eye contact. You had a fifth person, mm. it's difficult. So you can get better engagement, better conversation. In, in fours? In fours. It's a magic, magic number. Mm. It's interesting that. We had this bloke, uh, Vin Walsh, he, was, uh, he lectures on, uh, on brains. You know, he's a learning expert. And he came in and he said, that's one of the magic things, fours. Whenever you got people, get them in force, and it's, really? it's right. And you, and it's true. Like you got four people now, I can keep contact. You got a fifth one there, he misses out. So that person will tend to go to their phone because they're left out of the conversation. Hmm. Is there any other interesting things you've done around shaping environment? Oh, the, well, the other big thing I reckon is in team meetings, you've got to have everyone so they can see the white of their eyes, because we're the only primates primates that got white in our eyes. So the theatre room would be... You'll never have a theatre room. Always have them in a horseshoe. And you see uh, rugby league now. Right. So your... Pr- yeah, it's... Yeah. So those are old auditorium style yeah. where you're looking at the back of someone's head. So you've got no connection to them at all. Yeah. But, I mean, so I'm thinking some of the theatre rooms, it would be staggered seats. Yeah. So well, I don't like those theatre rooms. You don't like rather them. have them so they're looking at each other. The horseshoe. Because... Cause when you look in the wide of people's eyes, you can you can tell what they're thinking. Yeah, you know, there's connection there, and so apes don't have it. Have a look at apes; they have they don't have wide in their eyes. So we're the only primates, and there's a reason for it because we want to be connected. Mm. It's very interesting. <laughs> I can tell you uh, <laughs> do a lot of research on this. Oh, we try, mate, to keep mm. learning. Yeah. Well, well, mate, it's how to gain a competitive advantage yeah. how you can you know coach i know coaches yeah. are always looking for that yeah. no 1%. point n- yeah. well not even yeah. the one yeah. it's yeah. just what can we do yeah. to just elevate us a, a little bit you've got your big picture things your gym work your tactics your strategies your positional play but all those things make a difference yeah they, they really do um eddie thank you so much uh, for joining us here on the bar round. It's been a fascinating conversation. I really appreciate your time um, and wish you all the very best for the future. I'll be keeping an eye on uh, your next team and just watching those short passes. If you need anybody to come and have a little demonstration how it's done, I'd be more than happy to put my hand up. So <laughs> Japan Samurais, mate. That's where we're going. <laughs> Get me on that plane. No, thanks very much, mate. I enjoyed talking to you. It's been a real honour to meet you. So thanks, mate. Cheers. Cheers. Thank you, Eddie.